The last time I had this honor, I needed glasses, and I still do. <laughs> and so thank you, Susan, for highlighting and literally writing a line saying, stop, <laughs> this is stop here. And you color coded it just in case. Um, today's scripture is from Psalms 95, verses 1 through 7, a call to worship and obedience. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord and maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And let the people say, Amen. Amen. <laughs> that wasn't written. I. <laughs> Thank you, Tamron. So the title of my sermon today is Slow Your Heart. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel like from the second we wake up, our poor hearts are under assault. Can I have an amen? <laughs> I mean, tell me if this sounds familiar, right? You wake up. First wake up in the morning, right? And for a split second, you lay there all warm and cozy in your bed. And then, wham! Your to-do list hits and all the stresses of the day just slam down in your head. And, oh, then you get up and you do the worst thing you could do. You turn on your phone. So when you're eating your Fruit Loops and getting your sugar high, you're reading the New York Times summary, which is all about violence and death and suffering and loss. And then you go out to the world with its crowded subways and buses and people in a hurry and walk into the work where your boss is in a bad mood and you are overdue on a project that should not have been on your plate in the first place. <laughs> Hello, right? Then you spend all day at work, no break. You swing by CVS to run an errand and the line is 10 people deep. So you decide to treat yourself with your final stop by buying a Powerball ticket at the local deli, and just as you're about to pay, the person in front of you reminds you that the drawing was last night and someone else won. <laughs> From the second we wake up, we ask our poor little hearts to go zero to 60 like that. And maybe that might be good for a Ferrari or a Harley Davidson, but that's not so good for us. I mean, we launch our little hearts into a spinning, fluttering, pounding flurry with angst and worry and fear. We never take a break, never take a pause, never slow or take a beat. Now, the physical damage to our hearts from that is obvious, but I want to talk about a bigger issue here because when our hearts flutter with stress and angst, our spirits follow. We become spiritually unmoored, unsteady, ungrounded. Why? <clears throat> because when we're worried about what the world is throwing at us, we don't think about what God's presence is doing in us. Does that mean, I'm going to say it again then, I think. Because, all right, when we are worried about what the world is throwing at us, we are not thinking about what God's presence is doing in us. Friends, we need something to steady us. Return our attention to where it belongs. Now, I bet a lot of y'all are thinking, well, I know exactly what she's going to say next. She's going to say, friends, we need more prayer. Well, I would say that if it would work. Now, don't get me wrong. Prayer itself always works, but we don't always work prayer. Last week... I was walking down 31st Street, you know, just minding my business, la la la. And there's a food cart about two thirds of the way down on the street. And I walked along and 
you know, it's not unusual to have a food cart, but what was unusual is there was nobody manning the food cart. And as I walked past, I noticed beside the cart, in the street, near the curb, the owner was kneeling on his prayer rug, praying to the east. Now you think about that. In midday, in midtown Manhattan, in the height of lunch hour, rush hour, a food vendor has stopped his business to slow his heart and connect with the holy. Now, I would love to think that we are all as disciplined as my friend on 31st Street, but I honestly don't think we're there yet. No, I think what we need, we is some pretty obvious reminders that are right in front of our face to circle back to God. We need something akin to like a spiritual Apple Watch vibration <laughs> to remind us to slow our hearts and bring our awareness back to God in the midst of our busy day. And the scripture that our own Tamron Hall read for us this morning, Psalm 95, gives us a hint of what that reminder should be. In God's hands are the depths of the earth. In the mountains, the peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it. His hands formed the dry land. To draw near to God, all we have to do is draw near to God's creation. The trees, the flowers, the sky, the bounty of the earth. Every time we walk out and notice God's creation, we are drawing near to God. We are slowing our hearts. Now, some of you may be thinking, yeah, Susan, that's great if you live in Montana. <laughs> but we're not in Montana. We're in the middle of New York City, where finding God's creation is not quite that easy. Well, let me just say this, and I dedicate this to all our French-speaking live stream viewers, au contraire. <laughs> Aza. May I ask you to hit those two lights for me in my office? Would you mind doing them? Now, Oz is going to double as our music minister and light tech today. I think we can all agree that Genesis tells us that God created trees and seed-bearing plants, right? Amen? We're all there? Well, right outside the door of this church, like five feet away, are these gorgeous trees planted in the middle of the sidewalk right there. And seed-bearing plants planted at the base of those trees right outside the door. And if that's not good enough for you, walk five blocks down the street and you can get a whole forest of trees in Madison Square Park, right? Or how about if that's not good enough for you, just walk out the door and go to a farmer's market. I mean, who can't, remember Deuteronomy 33? I mean, I know that that's on everybody's mind. Okay, but <laughs> let me remind you, talks about God's blessings through choice fruits, rich yields, finest produce, abundance of the hills. Toby and I took these pictures just yesterday. All right, beautiful, beautiful examples of God's bounty. Now, listen, if none of this works for you, then just go get on the Staten Island Ferry. Okay, get on the ferry and feel the presence of God through the Hudson River. Who could forget Genesis 1? In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. I mean, as our introit shared, the presence of God is in this place, is in this place. Just open your eyes, walk out the door, look out a window. Because in the in creation, the presence of God is palpable. The energy of God is humming. In God's natural creation, we not only draw near to God, we are healed. Now, I want to give a little shout out to a wonderful poet I've been reading who inspired the sermon title today. Her name is Alexis Pauline Gums, G-U-M-B-S. She's an award-winning poet activist, ecologist, and naturalist. And her book I'm reading has this amazing title. You ready? Undrowned, U-N-D-R-O-W-N-E-D. Undrowned, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals. 
right? It's a brilliant collection of poetic observations about what God's creations in the sea might teach us about things like community, justice, self-worth, and love. I want to show you a one-minute clip of her reading from this poem and from her work. Before she goes underwater, the harbor seal will slow her heart. Yes, from 120 beats per minute to three or four heartbeats per minute. But first she exhales. When she is underwater, the oxygen she needs is the oxygen she has. Her blood breathes for her through her muscles as she descends as deep as 1,500 feet, deep enough for what she needs to do. She slows her heart and listens, reaches, knows. What if you could hear the world between your heartbeats? Slow down enough to deepen into trust. How can I learn the skill to tell my heart, slow down? Slow your heart about what she has learned from a harbor seal. She goes on for almost an entire chapter about the power of slowing your heart, which she learned by observing God's natural world. So this morning, I want us to follow her lead and do the exact same thing. And as a kind of into leaning into the second half or the ending of our sermon, I want us to consider four short, very short examples of things right outside our doors that we can use not only to slow our hearts, but to heal. Example number one, birds. Now, what do we have more of in New York City than anything else? Ta-da, pigeons. Estimates say that we have one pigeon per person in Manhattan, <laughs> which means we have approximately nine million pigeons on this island. Now, why am I telling you this? Because now you know there is no excuse not to find this example of God's creation <laughs> to meditate on, okay? Now, why would this creature slow our heart? What in the world does a pigeon have to teach us? The ability to find home. Now, we've all heard of carrier pigeons. One of the, we kind of dismiss pigeons as kind of dirty and sketchy and weird. Throughout history, pigeons have been known to have a powerful homing instinct. They are able to fly thousands of miles away and yet find their way home. In fact, in World War II, it was a pigeon that carried the first news of the D-Day invasion to Britain. Through fog and storms and German fire, it found its way home. So let me ask you, you ever felt like you've lost your way? Have you ever felt like you weren't sure where home was for you? Walk outside, look at a pigeon, and think about how you can trust the power of your own homing instinct. Here's another example, plants. Now think about how plants find a way to grow and thrive in the most inhospitable places. I mean, cactus bloom in the desert. Water lilies bloom out of the muck of a lake. Or how about the ubiquitous dandelion on a New York City sidewalk? I mean, have you ever felt like you were planted in an inhospitable environment? Have you ever felt that you were being asked to grow in a place with no nourishment? Walk outside, find a plant blooming in a tough place and realize the power of resilience that God gives all of us. How about trees, trees? Well, while it's not happening yet, soon all these trees are going to drop their leaves and look bare and brittle and lifeless, even dead. This is what Madison Square Park looks like in January. However, 
there's way more going on here than what looks like lifeless branches. In this winter time, meditate on these bare trees because the trees drop their leaves in order to conserve water, to center their energy. And what appears to be a quiet time of death is in fact the combustion engine of life. I mean, I think of these trees as like a sprinter, you know, in that stage, a quiet, motionless crouch. All the energies and, and focus are drawn down into that moment before the runner springs into action. These trees are in that crouch. And what their race is, it begins in the spring. I mean, think about it. Have you ever felt lifeless? Have you ever faced a moment when you have dropped all your leaves and wondered, would there ever be a new beginning? Then just walk outside. And in a few weeks, look up. And remember, even in the barest branches, a hidden life force is humming. Let's look at the last example, rocks and stones. You know, rocks and stones have such wonderful things to teach us. The ancient people believed as the oldest part of creation, stones were the witnesses to all life. In fact, that they could even speak. And while that may sound crazy, let's think about what Jesus said in Luke, even the stones cried out. Rocks have gone through pain and turmoil and cataclysm and upheaval, and yet think about the beauty and strength that comes from that pain. Consider the Grand Canyon, formed from thousands of years of being cut through by water, worn down by wind. Or how about Glacier National Park, formed with thousands of years of an ice age. Or the Rocky Mountains, formed from huge tectonic shifts of land masses clashing and slamming against each other. I mean, ever felt like you had an ice age in your life? Can I have an amen? amen? Have you ever felt like something had cut you through and worn you down? Have you ever felt like there were tectonic shifts going on in life? Well, guess what? As New Yorkers, all we need to do if you are going through any of those things is go to Central Park or go to Van Cortlandt Park or Pelham Bay Park or Inwood or Riverside Park because the bedrock of New York City was formed by a combination of all three of these things. Tectonic shifts, erosions, ice age. Go find a rock outcrop in Central Park. Sit on it and think about the beauty, but most of all the strength that can come from that pain. Friends, we got to find a way to slow our hearts to heal our hearts. And one of the quickest, most powerful ways to do it is to just walk out in creation. Draw near to the one who created us. You know, science has estimated that within an average human lifespan, we each get about two billion heartbeats. We each get about two billion heartbeats in an average human lifespan. So the question becomes, how do you want to spend those two billion beats? Do you want your heart burning through those beats in fear and stress and anger, or do you want to slow your heart and commit every one of those precious rhythms to be the beats of love and mercy and kindness? I want to leave you this morning with one last image. If looking out at all the many examples of creation all around us on earth doesn't slow our heart, then walk out one night and look up. I mean, even in the middle of New York City, you can find a place somehow, somewhere that you can see just even one little twinkling star. And even if you can't, just pretend that you do. And when you pretend that you're looking at that little star that is probably more like a, a bus light, but whatever it is, when you are meditating and you see that little star up in the heavens, then I want you to remember these words from one of my favorite poems by Kenneth Runkowitz. A star chart tells me that the star I'm seeing tonight is 500 light years away. 
It may have died 499 light years ago, but I'm still seeing its last light. Stars are born, they live, and they die. What is the light that remains when we leave? And the people said, Amen. Amen.